very much, um, Tony, for uh, inviting me to present a paper on biased belief. And uh, I also want to thank Eric for, you know, our facilitator for spending time reading the paper and providing us already on Slack some of the very constructive comments. Uh, I also want to apologize again to everyone that I just completely got wrong the time zone. I thought it's the Pacific time, like 10 a.m. when everything started, but it's actually the Eastern time, obviously. And um, so I missed some of the very interesting talks. Actually, I was interested in working on some of the, the topics in the earlier talks myself. So it's, uh, I hope to catch up with some of you later. All right, so this is a joint work with Matthew Shang, my senior colleague from Caltech, and then Mali Zhang, who uh, used to be a, a graduate student uh, from, from Caltech, but now a consultant at uh, BCG. Um, all right, I think, um, let me just give a quick overview of this paper. Um, we know from the recent years of developments in behavioral economics and behavioral finance that this biased beliefs, you know, this type of biased belief formation is kind of important. It's a key component for many of the recently developed models. Um, and there are, you know, several different ways that you can model biased beliefs. But one, you know, one traditional way that has gained lots of popularity uh, recently uh, after the Greenwood and Schleifer 2014 RFS paper uh, is the, is the, extrapolate, the notion of extrapolative belief. So man, many real world investors, both individual and institutional investors, according to surveys, their expectations of an economic variable, say the stock market return or future inflation rate, depend positively on recent realizations of this economic variable. And then you can also examine like whether the subjective expectations about this economic variable uh, are systematically biased and you see some forecasting errors and you, know, you can compare these subjective expectations with realized uh, outcomes and they, they don't line up very well with each other, suggesting that these expectations are quite biased. And so far, most of the research on bias belief focuses on the negative implications. For example, we know that they could contribute to uh, asset bubbles and then that could amplify subsequent crashes or lead to a very uh, slow, slow recovery. Um, but this paper, in this paper, we're trying to do something different. We're trying to focus on the more positive, the positive implications um, of this bias beliefs. And I think the idea here is very simple. You know, we consider a uh, economy populated with producers from the supply side who uh, make real investment decisions based on biased beliefs that I will specify um, a bit later. But basically, these people have this kind of extrapolative um, expectation. They expect what we call insufficient mean reversion in future market conditions. For example, like nowadays after COVID-19, you know, we think that the state of the economy is not very good. And then there's this question of how quick the recovery will be. And many people may be too pessimistic thinking that the recovery will not happen um, for a long time. So that's a notion of insufficient mean reversion uh, that we're trying to capture in this model. And then given this bias belief, these producers, uh, these firms are making suboptimal investment decisions. And that in the short run, these suboptimal uh, decisions will impose uh, welfare losses on the economy, but this bias belief could be somewhat beneficiary, beneficial over longer terms as they cushion the economy against prolonged, prolonged downturn and uh, they could even accelerate um, uh, recovery. And the mechanism, it's, it's very straightforward. If you have a sequence of uh, negative market shocks, then these producers being you know, biased in their belief, they think that this uh, negative shocks will persist into the future and that lead them to uh, underinvest, they cut down investment too much for not only this period but many periods in the future, and that lead this underinvestment to accumulate over time, and that would in turn counteract the uh, general trend of the economy, the general uh, negative trend of the economy, and that uh, will cushion out the economy, helping the economy to get out, out of this um, recession faster. So that's the basic idea. Um, 
And then, you know, to quantify um, this idea, we look into a particular uh, empirical um, case study. We, we look at this behavior and experience of uh, oil producers operating in a specific region of Alaska, this north slope of Ala uh, region of Alaska. And then the empirical findings we, we see from these oil companies are quite consistent with the presence of bias beliefs on the part of producers. So there are three pieces of empirical findings here. The first one is not very surprising that the number of new wells drilled is positively correlated with recent oil prices, you know, levels of oil prices from the recent past. And then, you know, so that would be fully rational, but then you could say, are these new drillings really profitable? Uh, we look at the five-year initial production and five-year profit from oil production uh, for this newly drilled wells. And we find that both production and profit over the next five years are negatively correlated with uh, recent past uh, levels of uh, oil prices. So that is sort of an indicative, uh, you know, it's indicative for maybe some kind of an inefficiency. And then another piece of data we have is that you know, these oil companies uh, apply for permits for drilling, but then after the permit got approved, they have a two-year, 24-month period that they can change their mind and uh, scrap off the, the, the well. So there's a scrappage data we have, and we find that a number of uh, scrapped wells, so that's the well that they plan to drill, but they end up not drilling, uh, it's negatively, uh, this number of scrappage uh, wells uh, is negatively correlated with the uh, average changes in price during the subsequent uh, two periods. So if you have, you know, following like a very uh, high level of prices, if the prices since the approval of the permits dropped significantly, then you find that the number of scrappage well, uh, scrapped wells increases. So people tend to change their mind. It's sort of consistent with this kind of a projection bias type of a, um, uh, time inconsistent behavior. So, um, you know, so these, I think that these three pieces of evidence from the uh, oil drilling uh, and production um, data, they're all consistent with this notion of over extrapolation. But we do want to acknowledge the fact that, you know, given that we do not directly have survey data, belief based data, uh, we only have observational field data from, uh, from, from, from this uh, Alaska um, data set, uh, it's challenging for us to directly. Uh, pin down a belief-based uh, channel. There could be some alternative um, channels like time-varying risk conversion or some other channels that you have in mind. So survey evidence on beliefs would be ideal and maybe we could also um, look for a different case study from, a, from another setting that will have more data on beliefs. Um, another thing I want to briefly mention, I'll, I'll come back to this a bit later, is that uh, it turns out that uh, for both beliefs in the model that we're advocating and also the behavior like drilling activities, we see some kind of a past dependent, some past dependent features of both beliefs and behavior. So the oil companies, they seem to extrapolate to a lesser degree when recent oil prices rise at an accelerating rate. So if you take like 0.1 and 0.2, T1 and T2, the total price increase is a constant, but it could either be like a steady linear increase or it could be a convex accelerating increase. It turns out that if it's the second case with an accelerating increase, then they over extrapolate, but they over extrapolate to a less degree, resulting in less trading activities. And this is quite consistent with a more general belief formation process uh, that uh, I'm currently working on with Cameron Pong from the London School of Economics. And it's quite motivated by the law of small number, um, a very well documented bias belief from the lab setting. Um, I'll come back to this a bit later. And then finally, for the, for, the, for the rest of the paper, we did some model calibration. We tried to quantify the uh, magnitude of the Cushing benefit by calibrating the model using parameters appropriate to the oil 
industry. And then in a typical episode of oil price decline, so there's some sequence of uh, negative uh, uh, market shocks, um, then the cushioning benefit, it turns out to reduce the decline of the oil price by about 8% and accelerate the price recovery by uh, four months, which is 27%. And then we will show you at the end of the talk a particular example. We apply the model to, uh, to the ongoing uh, oil price collapse due to COVID-19 and, um, um, and, and show you what the uh, uh, cushioning benefit is in that particular case. So for the rest of the talk, I'll, I'll briefly talk about this very, you know, simple model and uh, discuss some implications. And then I will go into the uh, oil uh, industry, this oil exploration data as an empirical case study, and then talk about model calibration. And then I think I want to open to some discussions on to talk about some open thoughts of like what can make the paper uh, stronger and then I'll conclude. So this is like a, uh, like a standard uh, investment model. There's this price of this output good HT. So in the case of the uh, oil industry, this could be the, you know, the oil price per barrel. And this, but in general, is the price of the output good HT, which is positively related to this factor A, which captures exogenous market conditions, like the state of the economy. And shocks to AT represents the, uh, the uh, main source of market uncertainty from the firms, the producers' point of view. And this price is also negatively related to this aggregate level of capital. And uh, that's an investment decision made by uh, a, a continuum of risk neutral firms. And this factor 80, this market condition I was talking about, that involves the true process, the uh, objective process involves like, you know, in, in the AR1. Uh, fashion is involves randomly with zero dependence. And this is the noise term, and this is the autoregressive parameter. But from the firm's perspective, the firms perceive um, something uh, quite different. You know? So the firms uh, in this model uh, do not directly observe the true uh, long run mean of this AR1 process, which is assumed to be a constant. But the firms instead uh, believe that this long run mean is actually changing. So the long run mean, it's related to this variable AT bar, which is basically a weighted average of past realization of the market condition. So you can, you can change this parameter rho A so that, you know, this AT bar is the slow moving average of, um, of past, um, past realization of market conditions. So just to um, illustrate uh, this intuition, how, how, how this bias belief work, you can think in this, you know, look at this paragraph, this true long run mean A bar in this, uh, sorry, in this graph, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the dotted line here and it's set to, it's normalized to zero. And then this solid blue line here represents the time series realization of the market uh, condition AT. And then this dash dot line here is the firm's perceived long run mean. So you can see that in this graph, the difference between the uh, solid line and the dotted line, uh, the flat line here represents the objective degree of mean reversion, whereas the difference between the solid line and the dash dot line represents the subjective degree of mean reversion. So you can see that when the market condition increases over time, uh, the firm the firm's estimated long run mean of this market condition also increases so that leads to insufficient uh, mean reversion relative to the truth under the firm's subjective beliefs. And then given this type of belief, the firm is going to make uh, investment decisions. So this is quite standard. So this, uh, you know, there's this capital uh, aggregate uh, capital is having this depreciation, but then it's going to be uh, increased by this uh, incremental investment. And this P is something called the leakage parameter. So in the case of a uh, of uh, oil drilling, um, you can think of P as the success rate of drilling a well. 
and then uh, the representative firm, uh, oh, sorry, so this time to build in this model, it's one period, and that's something, some assumption that we're thinking about uh, relaxing later to allow for different uh, time to build periods. And then the representative firm in the model earns a net profit, you know, it's related to the price um, of the final good, and then M is the average number of final goods obtained from each unit of capital, and then there are two kinds of costs here, the operating cost, C, and then this replacement cost, PR. So at each point in time, each firm just basically chooses its investment level to maximize its expected discounted sum of future profits. And then this is a quadratic linear model and that leads to a very simple linear optimal level of investment, thanks, uh, which, is, uh, you know, which is related to the three state variables um, in the economy. All right, so I just want to show some model implications. By the way, these three panels have the parameters already calibrated to the, uh, um, to the oil industry data. So you could, uh, if we choose a different industry, like, like the housing market, we will redo this and show a different result. So we think about basically a sequence of uh, uh, five uh, half standard deviation negative shocks on AT on these market conditions that will lower the uh, the investment. So the uh, uh, the blue solid line here is the um, is the rational benchmark where um, the uh, producers have the correct belief on the true long run mean of the market condition, whereas the uh, the, the red line here is the behavioral model where the producer, the firms have insufficient inversion um, in, the, in, the, in the market condition process. So you can see that after negative shocks, market shocks on these market conditions, if you're over extrapolating on these negative shocks, then you're going to think that the market conditions will deteriorate and this deterioration will persist and will persist for, for a long time. And that will result in under investment for each of these periods. And that accumulate over time, resulting in lower capital. Sorry, so this notation here should be KT rather than QT. We changed the, uh, the, the notation uh, a couple of years ago, um, but I forgot to change the graph here. So this aggregate capital is basically accumulation of all the all the investment over time. So if you're in the behavioral model, that would lead to a accumulation of this under investment, and that will at some point start to cushion out the price decline. You can see that in this particular example, even like from period four, five, and six. So even with in the in the face in, uh, in the presence of uh, negative uh, uh, market shocks, the cushioning effects start to kick in and uh, prevent the uh, the market price from going down further. So um, so that leads to, as I mentioned earlier, about uh, eight percent less of the total decline. And then if you look at the recovery, uh, then the uh, cushioning uh, benefit would lead to uh, recovery that is four months faster compared to the rational benchmark. Um, I want to mention uh, a bit, I want to talk a bit more about this past dependence of firm uh, beliefs and investment. As I mentioned earlier, you know, so this is a model where uh, the producers have insufficient uh, mean reversion type of belief, but the degree of insufficiency of mean reversion really depends on the pattern of this price pass. If you have an accelerating convex price increase, then the degree of mean reversion, insufficient mean reversion is not very high, but if you have a steady price increase, that would lead to uh, stronger, uh, you know, trending type of belief. So accelerating price increase induces stronger mean reversion, or in, in other words, less insufficient mean reversion in future prices perceived by firms, and therefore that leads to less overinvestment. So even though it is overinvestment, it's going to be less if you have accelerating price increase compared to a steady linear uh, price increase. 
So this type of belief in the domain of portfolio choices or investor trading behavior, uh, that's quite consistent with the empirical findings of Barbara Odin Drew. So they find that both the buying and selling propensities from individual investors depend positively on recent on past returns, but uh, the selling propensities depend on more recent uh, past returns, whereas the buying propensity depends on more distant past returns. In other words, if you have a convex increase of price pattern, that tends to lead to sell decisions, whereas if you have a concave price increase, that tends to lead to buying decisions. And that's quite consistent with, with uh, what we find here. And then in, 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 the, in the domain of asset pricing, Greenwood, Schleifer, and you, their uh, bubbles for pharma, JFE paper, they find that uh, if you have accelerating price increase, then the crash likelihood goes up a lot. So that again is consistent with the, with the, with the notion that people's beliefs become more reverting um, if you have, um, sorry, um, if you have, um, if you have uh, accelerating price increase. And this type of like a richer past dependence of uh, investor beliefs cannot be captured by simple uh, extrapolation models like the Barbara Schleifer and Wish in 1998. I just want to elaborate a bit more, you know, so this is a bit like a brief digression uh, into something I call the law of small number type of beliefs. So the belief that you just look at from the paper, right, so the thing I talked about here for the producers is sort of a special case of a broader class of beliefs that I have been working on recently with Cameron Pong from LIC. So you can imagine now, you know, if this is like a, a price uh, growth for say individual stock, thank you, or uh, a, a stock market, then let's say this is a subjective uh, price process where investors have this bias belief, they think that the average return of uh, um, the subjective expectation of this return is having this two component. One is this RT bar, which is a long run average of past realization of returns, where theta T is the short run average of, uh, of um, past realizations of returns. So it's basically sort of, um, competition between long run average and the short run average. So what happened here is that if prices has been increasing steadily and all of a sudden you see a drop, then that drop is going to update the short run average to a larger degree, sorry, this theta t, than the long run average because the long run average is more slow moving compared to the short run average. And that will allow this term in the belief process to kick in and that lead to a mean reversion type of belief. But if the price has been increasing steadily over time, that would lead to updates for both the long run average and the short run average. And then this model would lead to more of a, a kind of a trending type of belief. So this belief process is quite rich. It could generate short run reversals and long run extrapolation. And in the domain of investor behavior, it could explain a wide range of empirical patterns. For example, not only about the aggregate disposition effect, but also about about the fact that this position effect is more pronounced over short horizon. It's not only about the V-shaped pattern from Van David and Hirschleifer, but it's also about the heterogeneities of V-shaped patterns across different individuals. And we're trying to document new findings for that. And then this type of belief is also quite consistent as we're currently looking at this quite consistent with survey data, uh, survey evidence, um, aggregate stock market and, um, and dividend expectations. But anyway, so I think the broad point here is that, you know, our process for this particular paper, for the cushioning paper, it's basically a special case of this law of small number type of belief that I'm advocating through a sequence of papers. All right, so coming back to this paper, uh, I want to look at some empirical application to quantify the cushioning benefits. So we, so far, look at this oil industry, uh, we think that the oil industry uh, is quite suitable for our study. It has pronounced boom and bust patterns periods so that allow cushioning to potentially play a quite important role. And then we have data from Alaska 
oil drilling and production, we think that Alaska is a suitable stage for our analysis. It's one of the biggest, largest oil producing states in the U.S. And this particular area, this north slope area, so ANS Alaska North Slope crude oil is a key component of the overall U.S. oil production. Um, and, uh, and given its location, is the Arctic location uh, for uh, this uh, North Slope area, local drilling uh, decisions are actually quite independent from the decisions in other regions. You know, so lots of major oil companies have headquarters in Alaska. They require lots of local know-how, so they make local decisions independent from the decisions in other regions. And therefore, you would Im imagine that you would expect that this local drilling activities to respond to the boom and bust cycle in the Alaska oil industry. So. Here is some, you know, brief uh, data description. So we have monthly Alaska North Slope first purchase price per barrel uh, from EIA, U.S. Energy Information Administration from 1977 to 19, sorry, to, okay, five minutes, to uh, uh, 2016. So this is monthly um, purchase price data. And then you can see that the price is quite stable until 2000 but then start to rise dramatically and then what we do is this is that we also look at the uh, average drilling cost per oil uh, crude oil well drilled each year uh, and then that's also following a similar pattern so what we do later on for some of the analysis is that we use the normalized oil price for our analysis, which is basically the ratio of the nominal price over the, uh, over the cost. And then that's, you know, you may still argue that there could be a slight, each, you know, downward trend, but this is much less, uh, uh, there's, the trend is much less pronounced compared to the unnormalized price. And then we also have uh, trailing data uh, from 1977 to uh, 2007. And then the initial five year profit is computed as the monthly production multiplied by monthly normalized oil price in the first 60, 60 months, first five years of well production. And then also we have the scrappage data for each permitted well. We have data that indicate whether drilling actually took place, whether wells are uh, scrapped or, it, or drilling take place. And so scrap, scrapped wells are those that receive permits. So they are proved to be drilled, but then the construction never took place within the, uh, the, the subsequent two years of the permit uh, approval. And the main findings, as I mentioned earlier, there are three pieces, right? The number of new wells drilled is positively correlated with uh, levels of recent oil prices. And then both the five-year production and five-year profit from oil production uh, of newly drilled wells are both negatively correlated with recent past uh, oil prices, indicating that maybe these new drillings are not very efficient. And then the number of scrapped wells is negatively correlated with both high levels of oil prices, but also the subsequent changes in prices over the two years since approval of drilling. So let me show you some figures really quick. So this is basically plotting together this number of well drilled in the uh, solid line, and then the dashed line is the, uh, is the normalized oil price. So if you move the dashed line to the right a little bit, then you can see that there's a very positive correlation between the, the drilling and the lacked oil prices. So again, this is consistent with what I was saying, the first finding that uh, the drillings are positively related to recent oil prices. And you can see this basically from the regression table. So this table not only show that some lagged prices will positively affect future drilling, but it also shows that if there's an increase, accelerating increase in price level, that would be to less the growth over drilling. So that's the past dependence that I was talking about, which is consistent with the loss for number type of beliefs. And then uh, in the interest of time, I'm skipping this five-year initial production and five-year initial profit regression tables. They are at the end of the slides. If you are interested, I can talk about them. And then I want to show you this regression results on scrappage, right? So 
whether a well is scrapped or not is negatively related to the two-year subsequent uh, percentage change in price since the approval of drilling. So if there's an accelerate, so if if price has gone up uh, and then you 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 have this approved drilling and then subsequently price uh, go down dramatically, then you change your mind and the well is is scrapped. So lastly, I want to show some real episodes. So this is the 1986 Saudi oil glut. So there was a global downward price trend from 1981 to 1985 that results in less oil production um, from the uh, Saudi Arabia. But then in 1986, they decided to give up this control on production. So they ramp up production that leads to further reduction in oil price. So from Alaska's point of view, these are negative market, uh, market shocks. So you can see that there is a sequence of, uh, so in, this is the, the circle uh, line here is the actual oil price. It has lots of drops and then here is uh, sometime in uh, 1986. And then what we do here is that we calibrate the demand, sorry, the, the market shocks so that the behavioral model uh, will produce a model implied price pattern that is roughly proportional to the actual oil price that you see from the data. And then the blue solid line here is the uh, counterfactual, is the rational benchmark where you shut down the cushioning benefit. And then you can see in this particular example, without the cushioning benefit, the recovery will be delayed by about five months. And lastly, this is the current example of COVID-19. Obviously, this is an ongoing episode, right? So we see that from uh, from February to April, there is this huge drop of oil price. And now we're in the middle of May and then things start to recover a bit, but we don't know really how long it would take for the recovery to finish. So this is just a hypothetical example. We're currently here in period 11, and then subsequently there will, will be recovery. So let's suppose that the oil price will go back to the, the pre-crash level in about four or five months. And then again, that what I did here is that I calibrate the market shock so that the model implied price, it's consistent with the actual price under the behavioral model with the cushioning benefit. But then the blue solid line here is to take away that cushioning benefit. You can run this counterfactual, you can see that without the cushioning benefit, the oil price will recover more slowly with, uh, with a delay of like three to four months. So that's pretty much it. I think that this discussion slide, I can leave it open. That's more for open discussions. You know, we're thinking about how to strengthen the paper. There are a few things we, we want to address from the, from the facilitator, from the discussant. Uh, and uh, let me just conclude first. So, so in this paper, we're trying to focus on this positive implications of bias belief. And we develop this simple investment model to just illustrate the cushion benefits and then apply the model to uh, the oil exploration industry just as an empirical case study. Our channel doesn't really directly depend on the oil industry. We're open to other industry, other markets, other sectors, but we just use the oil industry as an as a empirical case study. And then in terms of future research, there are obviously room for alternative star stories. We want to piece out different stories more cleanly, and then we want to better understand the micro foundations of bias beliefs. So great.